If you've been following along with our contact tutorial series, you have already seen some amazing ways to create some samples. Now it's time to get acquainted with the contact sampler and start getting our samples into an instrument that you can play. Hey, my name is Steve, composer, engineer, and lecturer. Welcome back to the channel and your first steps into the contact sampler. We are launching into chapter two of this series now. Chapter one, of course, took you through many different ways to create samples, both acoustic recordings and hardware synthesizers, and even manipulating them with further effects and sampling methods. Now though, we're gonna dive in and build an instrument inside contact. We're gonna learn about how to get the samples into zones, those zones into groups, how to control those with modulators and effects and get an instrument that you can actually play. There's already been some amazing feedback on that first chapter, so do keep it coming. Why not let us know in the comments how you've been using this series? I'd love to see what you're doing. You can, of course, at any time, go back and have a look at those videos, revisit and remind yourself on some of the content. But for now, let's dive in and get going. Okay, so what is contact? Contact is a sampler, which means it's playing back pre-recorded sounds that are mapped to specific keys and sometimes specific velocities and hits. Now these sounds can be percussive or they can be pitched like the ones that I created in chapter one that we'll be using in this chapter. Really though, anything can be sampled and anything can be played back, which makes it really flexible at creating something brand new and really exciting or recreating your favorite instruments. Contact is one of the more complex samplers with a lot of creative options and a lot of amazing tools to help speed things up and get really creative with the sample libraries you're creating. However, to get a basic library up and running, it's actually fairly straightforward. So that's what we're gonna take a look at through this chapter. However, the first thing you need to know is how contact is structured. It is structured in a particular way. This will begin to make a lot more sense as we dive into the library and start building it. Contact is essentially accepting samples and putting them into what's called Called zones. Those zones can be mapped across one or more keys and across any particular velocity range. This is how we can be a little bit economical with our sampling. As we saw in the first episode of chapter one, you could sample in major thirds or minor thirds or something larger like fifths or octaves, and you can stretch those samples down or up to other keys. So you could be a little more economic. You don't have to record every single note, just a few so you can stretch them over the other notes that are around them. Now those zones need to be collected together into groups, and you could have multiple groups depending on multiple different collections of sounds or whether they're short or long articulations, whether you intend them to be sustained or just one shot samples. There could be a lot of deciding factors as to what one belongs in what group. It's, it's really up to you. But those those groups are then all contained in an instrument. So to recap, you have samples and they live inside zones. Those zones can be spread across multiple keys and any range in velocity. All of those zones are then collected together into groups and those groups are collected into an instrument. Hope you're with me so far. This will make more sense as we progress through the instrument creation. You'll actually see the groups at play. You'll see the zones belonging into them and see why I'm making decisions to put some zones together in a group and others into different groups. In this particular case with my instrument, I've got four different sample layers and I'm gonna put them each into their own group. So I'll have four groups. This is so I can control things like volume or pitch or envelope later on to specific groups rather than all of them together. Gives me a little more flexibility. Okay, so let's take a look at the contact sampler. So I've loaded up contact sampler here and you'll notice that it's got a few main components. First of all, I've loaded this standard instrument or library that I've got. So we have this Alicia Keys piano. It's quite a nice piano sound and it's one of the ones that came in a collection with complete at some stage. One of the benefits of buying contact in a complete bundle is that you get some of those instruments along with it. Now those extra instruments are all seen down the side here. You can see I've got a lot of drummers that are often appeared at the top because I've put my library preference into A to Z. So it's going through each one of these is an instrument or a library. As I scroll through, I do have other products in here from Spitfire, uh, some from Output down here, lots of different ones as I scroll through. Here's some Evolution series, lots of different things. Now our library unfortunately won't appear in there. We'll never get it to appear directly in that library panel. The reason for that is Native Instruments has a particular licensing agreement that you have to sign and hand over a lot of money to do. Unless you're looking to become a developer and a software company that sells your sample libraries, there's not really much of a benefit to this. However, if you come across to files, you can actually go through any kind of hard drive or library and load up any single one. So for instance, here is a library that is not connected to 
my libraries panel. And if I double click it, it ends in .nki, so it loads up here underneath. So that way, once you've got your library, you can easily do that. You can load it up in the file browser. The other option, of course, is once you have your library built and designed, you can actually just drag and drop any .nki file in there. That's a native instruments contact instrument. Drag and drop that there, and you can see it appears nicely there. And I can play that one. So there's actually a library that I've created for Piano Book. You can actually download that for free if you want to, but we're gonna take a look now at diving in and creating our own instrument. Really quickly though, before we do, you'll notice that I'm actually using this in standalone. If you take a look here, I haven't got a door or anything open up behind it. It is literally just the contact sampler. There's nothing open up behind here. You can develop your library in Contact as a standalone app, or you can load Contact into a software instrument in Logic and do it in there, or in Ableton or Pro Tools or whatever your door of choice is. You're not limited, and I really love that they do have a standalone app because sometimes you just don't need the door behind it. There's no reason for that. However, in the later stages, as you start to test your library, it can be really cool to load up your instrument into a door and double check some features are working. Things like maybe automation to see if that's working or MIDI CC control, see if they're being recorded in the door to be able to be played back as well. As well as of course, if you open it up in a door, you can program in your own MIDI into that region, cycle it and just have it play back. So if you're really testing something and you wanted to change controls and not worry about playing anything on a keyboard, that could be a great example to have a door open for you instead. For now though, we'll just continue in the standalone mode. There's absolutely no difference to how this is going to develop our library. Okay, so to create a brand new instrument, you need to jump up into the little save icon on here, the floppy disk, and jump down and go new instrument. It's as easy as that. At the moment, it's just showing you the header, but if we open up the spanner, this goes behind the instrument, into the back end of the instrument. In here, you have a number of different things. You have some instrument options, which you can easily load up if you ever need to. We'll be getting into that in chapter three. But across here are some other areas that open up and they can be quite important. Earlier, we spoke about samples and zones. We'll be loading our first samples into Contact Sampler in a moment. And we'll be doing that in the mapping editor. The mapping editor is where we would load a zone with a sample in and decide where it's going to appear and what keys are gonna be playing it and what velocity is going to be playing it. The other option, of course, that we can see up here is group editor. So these zones that I put into this mapping editor will be only in group one, and we can create groups two, three, and so on. We can rename the groups, do whatever we like with them. So we'll be looking at that in more detail next video as well. Episode four, we take a look at the wave editor. This is where you would see the sample inside the zone. So that's gonna become a bit more important in episode four when we take a look at looping a sample. Now we can toggle on and off these as we need. So that's really, really easy to do. Now underneath in this section down here, this is outside of our group layer. And we spoke before about how there are zones which have the samples in them. Those zones belong in groups and those groups belong in an instrument. This is the instrument layer that we were talking about earlier. So these instrument functions and effects and everything affect all of the groups rather than just one group specifically. Whereas when we're inside the group editor and doing anything in these boxes for one of the selected groups, that is gonna be just for the one group. That's not gonna be for the whole thing. And again, if we're in the mapping editor and we're editing something there, that's just the sample or zone within the group within the larger instrument. So some of these windows are specifically inside certain layers. Okay, so let's drag in our first samples. Now really quickly, I've got a new library that's up here called Foalon, and that's what the, what the instrument name is gonna eventually be. And I've got a folder that I've set up with everything that I need inside here. Documents to plan different things, all the recording sessions we did in chapter one, and now the samples are all located in here. In here, we've got our four sample groups that we're gonna be using, and I'm gonna load this last one first, these plucks. So I'll double click in here, and here are all of my samples, my 10 samples from my plucks. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make sure I've got my editor in view behind me, and I'm gonna highlight all of these, and I'm gonna drag them in. Now watch as I drag them in, because the closer I drag them to the bottom here, the less space the zone will be taking up, as in the less keys that they will be taking up. As I drag and move my mouse up to here, all of this done while holding the drag from my finder, they're gonna be taking up and spreading out more space. Now, I like to make sure that I've only got them on single keys, and I'll show you why in a moment. But let's just drag them in now. So I'm gonna highlight all of these, and let's drag them in. 
So you can see there, as I hold up the top, you can see the zones starting to form and they're spreading out and then contracting as I bring them down. So I'm going to bring them down, right down. I don't want to go so far to the bottom because then the bottom's going to just stack them all up. But I'll just leave them about there. So taking up one instrument each. Let go and here they all are. Each one of these is an individual zone. And if I open up the wave editor, you'll see the sample within each one of those. It's slightly different. You can see the sample name at the top here changing every time I click on something different. And the same up here as well. You can see the waveform it's referencing is a little bit different. Now in chapter one, you would have remembered that we named our samples a very specific way in episode two. Remember to check back to episode two if you weren't sure on how to name your samples. All of these have been labeled though as the instrument underscore the group that they're gonna belong in underscore the key that they were sampled on, the note that was sampled on. So when we dive into here and select all of these, all of these will be labeled something along those lines. This makes it really easy to do the next part. And this is why you'll be thanking yourself that you took that extra step earlier on. If we jump into edit and jump down to auto map setup, this is gonna pick apart the different parts of the name that are separated by the underscore. So you can see that like foal on there and then normally there'd be an underscore plux, underscore C2. So it's brought it all out. Now you can use that data to do certain functions. So if I wanted the plux to be the name of the group, I could jump in here and go make group name. For C2, I can say make root key. Now this is very important. We need to tell contact the sampler what the original note of that sample was. If we don't, it means that when we play a different key, it's not gonna transpose it correctly. If I record a C2, but I say that the root note is D2, for example, when I actually play D2, it won't be the pitch of D2 because it will be transposing it. So you need to say to every one of these zones what the sample root note really was. So that's why it's very easy to do when you've got the name already built into it because you can just say, make that the root key. Now I'm gonna take away this. I'm gonna just ignore it for now. I'll rename our group manually. What I'm gonna do here though is leave it as make root key and hit apply. Now when I select a particular note, you'll see that the root key has been picked out on the keyboard. And that one there, C2, should match the name C2. Let's check another one just to make sure. So this one here is being put onto, what's that there, G sharp two. Yep, G sharp two is there, all done. This is another reason why we use sharps and not flats because contact is ready for sharps. It knows what sharps are and it can do these sorts of automatic things when you label them as sharps. So if you have a G sharp, don't label it A flat, even if that is chromatically correct or melodically correct. Label everything as sharps. Now, right now, all of these samples are just grouped together at the bottom. We actually now need to spread them out based on their root key. So what I'm gonna do is another little shortcut. I'm gonna highlight all of these. I'm gonna jump into edit. I'm gonna jump to auto map functions. And there's one in here for auto spread key ranges via root keys. What this is gonna do is spread out the zones but centering them around your root keys. So that way it's gonna move that zone to the root key and then just spread out based on what's around it before it runs into another zone. Let's take a look at that. If I click that now, there we go. We can see that all of these regions have been spread out. Now this top one and this bottom one have spread out a long way and I'm actually gonna be reducing that because I only want the instrument to go from C2 to C5. Now before we could click on some empty space, but there's no empty space, so I can't deselect any of these. So just a little shortcut or a little help. If you jump into the edit menu and go deselect all zones, now you can click on one. Okay, so let's bring this back to C2. There's two ways of doing this. The first way is to actually just drag on the region itself. As I hover on any of these sides, we get some arrow markers. And I can just drag this one back to C2. Nice and easy. If I wanna do the same thing to this top one, I'll show you the other way, is that you can drag it, of course, which I find a little bit easier, but if you know exactly what value you want, you can come in here and you can drag this one up and down, or you can even double click and go C5, bang, there we go, really easy. Okay, so now we have some samples in there. Let's actually play the keyboard and see if it responds. Wonderful, we have a sound, we have something being played back, which is really, really cool. Last thing, of course, is how do we save this? Now that we've got our samples and our library starting off, 
we now need to save it. We need to do something to make sure that we can come back to this later. It's a very straightforward and simple process, but there are a few steps involved and a few different options. Okay, if I jump up to the save icon here and I jump in and go save edited instrument, it brings it up with a pretty standard save box. And it's gone to my last one Ambido library that I created a while back. Now, what I've done here is I've gone into my Foalon instrument. I've clicked on the instrument folder, and this is where I want to store my instrument. Now, the way that I like to do it is I like to store inside a folder called contact, because then at the end of the day, you should be able to just grab the whole contact folder and away you go. But I also pop in here instrument development. The reason I put it inside instrument development is that I actually save a few different versions as I go. As I make significant changes, I might save it as v1, v2, v3, and so on. At the very end, then I would create my alpha or beta testing or gold master testing and get it ready for sharing or ready for distribution or saving to my hard drive to reuse later. And we'll definitely be taking a look at that, of course, in chapter three, where we go test the library and see what to look out for. For now though, what I wanna do is give it a name and probably score it as a underscore V1. So I jump in here into instrument development and I'm gonna go foalon underscore V1. Now how I save it is very important. Thinking of again about how we're traveling at the moment and what we're doing at the moment. We're wanting to develop the instrument. We're wanting to save it. We're wanting to be able to reopen it on this computer. Theoretically, nothing should be changing or moving on this computer and no files should be going anywhere while you're working on this project. That's just a golden rule of thumb of anything, everything creative, to be honest. Any project that you're working on, don't move your files until you're done. So in that case, when I'm going through the development stages and I'm maybe saving different versions, what I might do is save the patch only. That will leave all the samples based somewhere else on my computer, which they already are, and it won't duplicate the samples, therefore taking up more space. That way as well as I add more samples, I'm not going to have conflicting samples or having to go find and copy more samples in. It just keeps a single instrument file and that's all we need for now. The samples, as long as I leave them in the same spot, will always be found. Later on though, you do want to use patch and samples. When you start sharing your instrument, you're going to need patch and samples. What patch and samples does is it saves the file, the instrument file, the .nki, but it also saves a patches file. This is really handy because then what you're doing is you're saving all of the samples together with an nki, and they're not absolute file paths, so they can be found no matter where you copy them to. As long as the sample folder and the NKI file are together in the same folder, your computer or any computer will be able to find the samples for it. So really handy when you start sharing your library with others or testing it on other computers. For now though, as I say, I'm just gonna pick patch only and hit save on that one so I can come back at any time. That's now saved at the top there, we can see that and we're all ready to go. The only other one there was Monolith. Monolith saves all the samples and the instrument into one file. It's kind of like a zip file, but you can still access it. This can be handy, particularly for testing purposes, but when you start scripting and you're getting into custom graphics, it has some major drawbacks. So I wouldn't get in a process or a habit of following a Monolith file for saving. I would save patch only while development, leave all your files in place, and then the final one when you're starting to test, save patch and samples. And there we have it. So we've become acquainted now with Contact, the sampler, its structure and what it looks like and some of the features within it. You've loaded your first samples, created your first instrument and saved it ready for the next lesson. So in the next video, we're going to dive into additional groups and velocity layers and see how we can make those a part of our library. This is part of a full series with three chapters. So do remember to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out and ding the bell so you get notified on the next one. Of course, if you're looking at this in the future, don't forget to head down to the description for the full playlist. So don't forget to subscribe on your way out, but otherwise, I'll catch you in the next one.